Welcome everyone to our video today. We've been discussing some of the chapters of the Bible that deal with purpose and the purposes that God gives to each of us to fulfill. Now the first one last week was in Ecclesiastes and it was written by King Solomon and he said that life is meaningless, it's pointless without God. Now, he didn't really mention about that, except for the fact he went through everything. You can read all the chapters, all the verses. It's a very um, melancholy type uh, uh, book. Uh, uh, Solomon said, you know, he had the temple, he had great houses, he had wives, he had wisdom, he had people that uh, adored him, that uh, people he was in control over. He had all these things, the, um, a bunch of land. Israel was at its height at that time. He had all of these things, and yet he could not find meaning in his life. And at the very end, he said, in order to really find meaning to life, you have to respect God, fear God, love God, uh, and to obey his commandments. So that's what he came up with, which isn't bad. So let's look at the second phase of this, and it's taken today's lesson. And it's that purpose, the purpose that we have, have people have given up on it in many cases. For instance, it says God created us with purpose, but our sin keeps us from living out that purpose. Okay, so that's very um, a very good section to follow up on the first one that we don't have, uh, that Solomon said there's really no purpose in life without God. Uh, and now he comes along, the writer comes along this time, and we're going to look at various scriptures throughout. And this, these writers say that there is hope if you walk with the Lord. And so we'll see how those come into to, uh, fruition together. And then there's four more after this, four more uh, purpose-driven type scriptures that we'll read that shows what God expects of us and how we can live up and fulfill the purpose that God has given us. Last week, it did not give us the, the, the uh, you know, real reason, except very short, very succinct. It didn't tell us how to go about it or anything else. But we will see as we move forward that the Bible gets more and more explicit on how we can find the purpose that God has given to each of us in order to, to live out our lives. Um, you may have uh, at times, um, you, you know, got maybe an old whiskey barrel an old, um, um, you can tell I don't drink much. I can't even think of the bourbon barrels that they make around here. Uh, and they age the alcohol in them or what have you. And then they sell the barrels. And they're really made, their purpose is made to put in the liquor, the alcohol, and to age it with charcoal. Um, now, people buy those all the time and they make other things out of them. That's really not the purpose they were intended or made for but they use another means or they use them for another means, another purpose in which when they modify them can make them do what they want to do. But that's really not the purpose that they were intended. And when we look at our lesson today, we're going to find out that people uh, that God intended us for one purpose to do one thing, certain things, maybe not just one, but certain things. And yet we have decided that we're going to do the things that we want to do and toward God's purpose for us and carry out his, his, our will instead of his will. So let's, let's look at um, uh, our scriptures today. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your uh, Sunday school books, we're going to look at um, Psalm 8 verses 1 through 6. Psalms 8 verses 1 through 6. Okay, now this is a uh, uh, written uh, we we give most of the psalms david credit for writing them but there were a lot of people who wrote the various psalms and it really doesn't matter who wrote them except for instance except uh, it will put us in the context of what where they were and how they were feeling like uh, you know the the uh, com comforting psalm that david wrote that talks about laying down with his sheep and taking them beside still waters and all of that that's good to know the context of that and that David was leading a pretty rough life as far as hiding from um, Saul and fighting in these battles, etc. Um, so, so here we're going to look at Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And the words of Psalm say, Lord, our Lord. And that's the tetragrammaton that's used there. That's the word for Yahweh. 
They don't put vowels in it because they did not want the Jewish people, did not want people to be able to pronounce that name of God. It was so holy. And so it's Y-H-W-H. Whenever you see that in your in your Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, uh, then that's known as the Tetragrammaton. Okay, uh, so anyway, he says, How magnificent is your name throughout the earth. So this uh, writer of this psalm is talking about how great God is. Before he even starts writing this psalm, he realizes the greatness that God has, the greatness that God can share with all of his creation, the greatness that God has, and he gives different reasons why he thinks he's great. One of them, and we'll read it in just a moment, but one of them is the fact that he has given us humans, lowly humans, so much power and so much responsibility to take care of his his earth, his land, his animals, and each other. He says, how, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth? So the writer says, your name is known throughout all the world. Now, whether or not it was known throughout all the world at that time, throughout all the, all the earth, is probably kind of doubtful, but a lot of people did hear of this God that the Jewish people followed, the God that the, that the Jewish people lifted up. And that was the, the uh, this God known as Yahweh. And when they would come sometimes into various territories, uh, they would, when they, uh, God's name would precede them and they would be uh, afraid because they knew of this God that gave the Jewish people so much power to take over various lands, etc. And so he says, how magnificent, how magnificent is your name in all of the earth? Not only does all of the earth do all the people of the earth, uh, lift you up and proclaim the goodness of your name and the power of your name. But even nature does, even nature and even people who don't know you, they know as they look around the areas and they see the sun, and the moon, and they see other things that this earth brings before them. They have to, uh, you know, actually um, look, look, look up to see the splendor of God, to look down, to look around and to see the splendor of God is all around us. And so God's name is magnificent. He has created all of these things. He says, you've covered the heavens with your majesty. Now by the heavens, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the skies. He's talking about the infinite eternal skies. When you look up at night and see all the stars and you know you can't ever count them. There's so many of them. And that God has covered the, has covered all of the earth with his majesty. And his majesty are the stars and the planets and everything that comes from the sky. And showing God's power and showing God's love for his people. That he protects them, that he cares for them. And that he puts on somewhat of a 4th of July show uh, of uh, fireworks, etc. That never ends. It goes on and on and on. Um, verse 2 says, From the mouths of infants and nursing babies. You have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. So he talks about here, out of the mouths of infants, and we use that even today. People will say that out of the mouth of infants. If a little child says something that's true and uh, everybody else may be avoiding it, but they, they may say it. Or somebody may say something that nobody else wants to say, and they may say, out of the mouth of babes comes this truth. And here he's talking about the mouths of infants and nursing babies. He's saying that the very lowest that of, of, of people on this earth, lowest in the sense that they don't have any, um, uh, what would I, well, really, not, uh, not a conscience of right and wrong, um, they don't have, um, you know, any empathy or consideration for other people. When you have a little baby, they'll wake you up anytime they want to at night. And so they are about the the uh, most uh, turned in creatures that that we have, that we know of. And they have to be. That's they, Nature allows them to take care of themselves the best way that they can. And then God entrusts them to us to take care of them until they get to be a particular age. We have a birdhouse out back and wrens come in about twice a year and, and have a nest, lay a nest and have a bunch of little wrens. And they're really cute when they come out of there, they plop down on the patio and sometimes they fly straight out of there. But you can see these uh, wrens taking care of their uh, little ones, taking food into them, 
on and on and on. It seems like it will never stop, on and on and on. The wren's peeping and, and tweeting and wanting food, and they don't care about their brothers or sisters. They just want what they want the food. They will take it right out of their brother's mouths if they can get it. Uh, and yet the parents just uh, continually bring it in patiently, giving them what they need, nourishment, giving them what they need in order to grow up and to serve their purpose. What's the purpose of a bird? Well, they fly in the air and they're beautiful to see. They eat bugs and insects, many of them. Um, and they have, you know, many different purposes. And Jesus even said that birds are so important that even my Father in heaven, even my Father in heaven knows when a bird falls. He knows when a bird dies. Not that they're greater than humans or anything else, but what he's saying is that God even takes notice of any any part of his creation. And when it dies, it's a it's a you know sad event for us and and for for God, he he knows what's happening. He's so he's aware of what's going on. And then Jesus went on saying, "So how much more will He take care of you?" And that's true. Okay, so he so he says, um, in order to silence the enemy, uh, he, well, he okay. Well, uh, verse two. Let me start there again. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold. A stronghold is that um, that. If you love God and you praise God and you sacrifice for God and you live for God, he provides a stronghold for you in your life. Uh, it's not a stronghold that keeps you from problems and difficulties. And I know that people say, yeah, God puts a fence around people to protect them from problems and difficulties. That's not true. Uh, unfortunately, and, and that may be kind of a stark thing for me to say to you, but that's really not true. Everybody has troubles. Everybody has problems. God does not protect anybody in the sense that troubles do not come upon them. God does protect you, those who believe in him, those that want his protection, those that reach out to him. He does prevent these bad uh, things, these adversaries that, that are around you from overcoming your mind and your body and dragging you down. So God does provide total and complete protection against sin and against, um, I mean, the, the, the evils of sin, just in a sense. Now, sin, we still have the results of sin that, that get in our lives and, and, and can cause problems for us here, but they cannot keep us from the head from heaven. So God has taken over. He makes sin be less powerful in our lives because with him in our lives, we can overcome anything, not on our own, but through him, and we end up with him in heaven. And so this is a very important aspect here that the writer is saying here. He has established a stronghold on account of your adversaries because those that are there, people are coming against you and God is going to protect you from them. And that's a great thing to know. On account of your adversaries, God protects you. Um, in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. And then he goes on to say in verse three, when I observe your heavens, so uh, David, you know, saw in creation God's work. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place. He's starting off a kind of an introduction to what he's going to say after this. He's saying, I look at all these great things that you've done. I look in the star. I look at the stars and the heavens and the earth and, and really, you know, people and animals and everything that you've created. And it boggles my mind that you can get it together that well to bring us these things uh, just in the right way and the right amounts and everything else to make to make uh, everything coincide and to work together. And he said, and I, I, and I can see this, David says, I can see this. Not only do I feel you in my life, because David talks about other places where he feels God's help in his life when he's down and, and distressed, you know, et cetera. But now he says, I also know that you're around because I look around and I see what's going on. I know that it wasn't an accident, but that you created them. Uh, and he says that, he says, which you set in place which you set in place. It didn't just happen one day uh, or, or we didn't, you know, build things. We didn't build the earth or build the sun or anything else. God did. God created all these things and put us in them. Verse 4 says, What is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and you put everything under his feet. That's, that's an astounding thing that David is asking here. He's saying, what is a human being that you remember him? Why are, 
How can we be that important for you to put us first? How can we be that important when we look at the universe and we see the sun and the moon and the rain and, and the rivers and the, the mighty oceans and everything else that goes on? How can we be even on the same page, much less great? You know, you made us greater than all of these things. How, how can that be? What did we do to deserve that? And so David is asking God. He's saying, I don't understand why you do that. And he calls himself a son of man. So he's talking about human beings. That human beings have all of these things going for them because God decided that, in verse 8, crowned him with glory and honor. Why would God do that for us? You know, why Why did God crown you with honor? Why did God crown you with, with a glory? We're just human beings. Well, it's because we were created in his image and God created us for a special purpose. And that is to take care of the, word, the, the earth to take care of its resources, to take care of each other. But more importantly than any of that is to worship God and to put God first in our lives. That's why God created us to have fellowship with him. And in having fellowship with him, we take care of all these other things that are not as important as fellowship with God. But it makes us because the other, you know, the planets and everything else, even as majestic and great as they are, they don't have fellowship with God, but you do, but we do. And that's an amazing thing that that's what God decided and how he decided to create us in this particular order so that we so we can love him. So, I mean, God doesn't really need our love to a degree. I guess somewhat he, he, he yearns it because he created us for that. And that's why we have free will, so we can love God. If you didn't have free will, we wouldn't be able to love God. We'd be forced to love God. But he gives us free will so we can choose to love God. And when we do that, then that makes everything uh, sync together and uh, let us know the importance that God has for you in his kingdom and for you and his relationship with us. Okay, so it says here that, that you made, verse 6, you made us ruler over all your hands, over, over the works of your hands. So um, everything that God made, we are rulers over those things, and you put everything under his feet. So this shows a great responsibility that God has given us. Now, that's really nothing to... Uh, make fun of. Uh, God has called us to take care of each other and to take care of his planet, of his world, to take care of the animals and to take care of um, the resources that he's given to us. You know, he's given us a, a lot of resources. He doesn't want us to pollute them. He doesn't want us to uh, make them so we can't use them. He doesn't want us to keep them from other people. Uh, unfortunately, one of the problems that we have in this world is we have enough food to feed everyone, but we don't have the re we don't have the the uh, processes or the people who are willing to get the food to everybody because of greed and because of other problems. But God has provided a a means to take care of everybody on this earth physically, and He wants us to do that, and that's one of the responsibilities that He gives to us. Okay, and then uh, in Psalm fourteen verse one, and I remember I had a um, teacher in high school. A, a priest, because I went to Catholic high schools, so we had a priest and he read the Bible a lot. And he was talking to us about how things can be taken out of context of the Bible. And he said, you can prove anything just by pulling a few things out of the Bible. And he said, for instance, it, the, the Bible says that the fool says there is no God. Uh, and uh, or, or just he just says there is no God. He said, and so, you know, you could make a point for that. There is no God. But then when you look up the scriptures, it says the fool says that there is no God. And so it means just exactly the opposite. And so now David is going, taking the next step, and he's saying that God has given us all of these things. What is our response to God? And some people don't accept that. They turn from God and they do their own thing. And he said that you're a fool. You're a fool in your heart. And, and, and a fool uh, is a secular person who should know about God, but chooses to live without him. That's what a fool is. Somebody who knows about God, but decides that they don't need God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds, these fools that he's talking about. There is no one who does good. Now, um, it, it's very difficult. Maybe you know people who are atheists, who don't believe in God, etc., but they're basically good people and they do good things, and that's very possible. But they don't do them really for the right reasons because they're not motivated for, for God, by God, to do those things. Well, 
and, and, I, and I do need to kind of backtrack. Sometimes they do it for right reasons. It's because they love people and they want to help them and they want to do whatever they can. But unfortunately, they're missing out on a great blessing because they can do all of these things for other people and yet get a blessing from God for doing them because God has provided all of these things. And in the first part of our lesson, he says that he wants us to help uh, these individuals and to work with them and to help them and to give them what they need to sustain life. And so when we do that, we get a double blessing. Not only do we get to help the people, but we get to, but, but, but God blesses us because we have, we are using him to bless others. Uh, and so, and so he says, though, unfortunately, people who says that there is no God, people who, who uh, have uh, foolishness in their heart, the fools, he said, they are corrupt and they do evil deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. So now he kind of turns from just the fool and he turns to the whole human race. And he said, not only are the fools foolish, not only do they not see God and do what God is calling them to do, but they have decided they're going to do things on their own. And I do that and you do that. And we become fools sometimes. We don't follow what God wants us to do. And we carry out things of our own heart and we carry out things that, that, that we think is important and not what God's important. We may step on our brothers or sisters in order to get what we want, like those selfish birds I was talking to you about. And God looks down and he says, not only do we have people who don't believe in me, but even the people who believe in me are vile. They do vile things. Let me put it that way. They do vile things. They don't get their, they don't get their ship in shape. And and you notice here, he said that, that the Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. So if just one person seeks God out of all the human race, and the answer is all have turned away. Does this remind you of Noah's Ark? All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. Corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. That's a sad, that's a sad commentary on us. You know, God made us, created us to be just a little lower than him and to provide us with responsibilities of taking care of nature, taking care of each other, taking care of the resources that he's given to us, to love him, to respect him, to lift him up. God has given us all these things and yet, and yet we fail. We don't, we don't do that. Not one, not one person is without sin. And that's basically what he's saying here. Verse 4, then, of uh, Psalm 14. Will, ev will evildoers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. So now he focuses again on evildoers once again. And he said, just like they go out and eat a loaf of bread, don't even give it a second thought. They consume my people. They take away everything that they have. They consume it, and they make it part of their life instead of a part of the other person's life. Instead of what God wants us to do instead of real life that we can find through Jesus Christ and through God himself. They do not call on the Lord. They don't call on the Lord. They go out and they do the things and they ravage and, uh, against other people, steal from them, sue them, you know, get, get what little possessions they have uh, because they want everything. Uh, you see these Westerns and stuff, you know, where, uh, where, uh, big uh, cattle barons, you know, they go out and they've got thousands and thousands of acres, but the ones they want are the ones that the little ranchers have. They want it all and they go and they do whatever they can, strip them, give them poor money for it, kill them, whatever it takes, you know, they'll, they'll do that. That's the idea that we get from God as he talks to us about these things in Psalms. We get that, that, uh, that picture that God has given us, everybody, so much that we don't need to go take from other people. And yet people do. Um, you remember that Madoff guy who had uh, billions of dollars and he uh, invested it poorly, didn't invest a lot of it, lost it all. And people didn't know it. And then when the time came to get their money, there was no money to pay him. And he took all these people's money, a very rich, wealthy man, took all these people's money. They were pretty wealthy, most of them, but let's just, you know, some, that's not always the case, and and took away from everything from them. A lot of them didn't have retirement anymore. They put all their money into retirement, and all of it just fell through. Uh, so we see a lot of selfishness, a lot of wickedness, and God is calling these people out here. Verse 5, then they will be filled with dread, for God is with those who are righteous. So the writer here, David, is saying, you know, 
hang in there, boy. Hang, you know, hang in there, fellas. Um, you may not have what everybody else has, but you've got God. And you are righteous. You are doing the, the right thing. And because you are righteous, because you're doing the right thing, God is on your side, not on the other people's side. Now, if you read in Revelation, we find out that when God comes again, he is going to be powerful, all powerful. Nobody can touch him. And, you know, he's going to come down. He's going to annihilate, you know, all evil, the devil, all difficulties, everything else. And people that he loves and people who love him are going to be reunited with him. And that's what it's all about. He says, you sinners, verse six, frustrate the plans of the oppressed. You know, so the, you know, you have the, the oppressed people trying to, trying to eke out a living, trying to just get enough to buy enough bread for one day. And yet it says that the sinners uh, frustrate the, the plans. They're, you know, planning a meal, planning this, planning that. They take it all away from them, give them no hope. Uh, but the Lord is his refuge. Now, you know, that's a terrible thing when you don't have much to start with, or if you have a lot, but somebody else comes along and they trick you out of it or take it away from you from force by force. They just take it and leave you with nothing. That is a terrible, terrible scenario. And the scriptures here is talking about just that. Uh, he says that uh, you, you frustrate the plans of the oppressed um, and, and all of these problems and difficulties, but the Lord is his refuge. So even when that happens, Remember that you have a greater power than God. I mean, than uh, these people have, than the oppressors have, and that is God. God will not protect you from them in the sense that he's going to keep you from making foolish decisions or they're not going to be able to kick the door into your house and cause trouble or steal something from you. Uh, we're not protected from that, but we are protected. God will take care of those individuals in the end, and he will give you the strength that you need to get through whatever situation and predicaments comes your way. Verse 7 says, oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion. Zion is, is Jerusalem. And uh, that is where Revelation also talks about Jesus Christ returning. Now, I really don't think that he's going to return in Jerusalem. I think this just means Jesus Christ is going to come again for the second time. And, and, and all of the earth, all of the earth is his. And the Revelation was written in apocalyptic style literature, which means hidden, hidden literature, uh, they they uh, could not just uh, clearly write a lot of things because the Romans, you know, uh, looked at their mail, et cetera, and wouldn't let it get out. Or they may hear, they may uh, confiscate some of these letters that were being taken around to the churches, and they wouldn't know what Revelation was talking about, even though it was talking about the destruction of Rome um, and, and bad people that come along after that. Uh, and so they would let it go on through. So I think here that when they say Jesus is coming back to... to um, to, to Zion. I mean, come on, Jesus is not limited to come back to one little country or one little city. He's going to come back to the whole world. He's coming back all at once, man. He's going to come back with all of his strength and his power, and everybody's going to hear of him. We're just not going to hear some thunder and some shouting halfway across the world. He's going to be right above us. He's going to be right in our midst. He's going to come. And he's going to get rid of Satan, get rid of evil, get, 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 get rid of oppression, get rid of suffering, get rid of problems, etc., and bring all of his people to him, those who are faithful to him and who love him. Uh, so the deliverance will come from Zion, which which it will. It's going to, The deliverance is going to come where, where uh, the Bible tells us that. Uh, oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. So um, the writer of Psalms, David, he's focused on Israel. He's not focused on us in America today. He doesn't even know about us. So he's focused on God's people. Well, God's people today, Israel, they're, they're, they're us, they're you and me. And when Jesus comes again, he's going to come on our behalf. And he's not going to just come and, and, and take, take up 144,000, you know, of the protected Jewish people, etc., which is in Revelation. Here again, that's, that's just a symbolic term. That's ridiculous to think that, that that's what they're what it's going to be. It's 12 complete religious number times 12 complete religious number times 10, which is a complete number in God's plan. So 144,000 is just a symbolic number. He's going to be taking a lot more than that to heaven, you better believe. But some denominations think that, that that's all that's going. Okay, well, I need to close there because we're just out of time. And I want to look at just a few of the things here that we looked at today. So let me uh, turn this around. And we'll quickly go go through these. I want to. I always try, like to sum up what we've talked about. Let's see. Let me put it like this. 
And uh, number one is that uh, no, if you have no God, you have no purpose in your life. That's what the writer here is saying. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes last week said that without God, you have no purpose in life. And that's what he's saying here as well. No God, no purpose. Secondly, you are important to God and are part of his plan. Well, I talked about that. Uh, we are part of his plan because God has given to us a way in which we can take care of things that he's given to us, take care of each other, take care of one another, serve God, love God, love our neighbors, etc. And then actions reveal our feelings before God. Just saying you love God is not enough. Your actions have to show that you love God. You say you love God and yet you are haughty and, and irreligious and take advantage of people and don't care about people and all these things. Then you're not. Then then you don't love God. Then your heart is not with God. So your actions reveal our feeling before God. And then finally, God saves and protects those who live for Him. God saves and protects those who live for Him. And here again, not in a physical sense, even though He can, but in a spiritual sense that God can. It will take care of you no matter what. I firmly believe that um, Satan cannot take away your salvation. He cannot take away the love that you have for God. He cannot take away all, any of these things. God has given to you these things and he protects you so that no one, no one, whether it's here on this earth or in heaven or anywhere else, can take those from you. So that's basically our lesson today. So we have the second step. The first step is that there is really no purpose in life. Um, and the second step is that we find that there is a purpose in life if we keep God first, if we put God first, we can find out what that purpose is. So we're going to get a little bit more detailed on that answer in our in next week's lesson. So let's just go ahead and close now in a word of prayer. Thank you for tuning in today. Lord, we do give you thanks for your love and for your glory and for what you promise us and for what you give to us. Thank you for your word and for the way it touches our hearts and touches our lives. Help us, Father, to uh, look into ourselves and ask, are we really doing what God wants us to do? Are we being his servants? Are we taking responsibility for this world and for our, for our neighbor, for those who we love and even those we hate? Are we taking care of them to bring them to a knowledge of you and to give them what they need? Thank you, Father, for all that you do and all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.